Are you excited or curious about the future? Does your job depend on it? Futurized goes beneath the trends, tracking the underlying forces of disruption. Tim, how are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great, but I'm not so happy to hear about the forest fires. Uh, let's uh, do that for a split second. How, how long have they been raging? Well, there's been fires all around Colorado all year. Biggest fire in Colorado history is taking place up in the north. But then one just erupted about 10 miles outside of Boulder, where I live, uh, just two or three nights ago. But luckily, the force, um, the weather, the weather's cooperating a little bit. It's finally cooling down, uh, but it's smoky in town today. So that's not ideal. That is not. Well, we are lucky to have a cool subject to talk about to cheer us up a little bit because that's right. um, well, soft robotics is interesting. So, so Tim, you are a uh, engineer, but a multidisciplinary one at that. Um, you work out of uh, Colorado, well, Boulder, U Colorado. Mm -hmm. I uh, I know you work with uh, Professor Christoph Kepling in the Keplinger Lab. Yep. Um, other than that, I think your PhD was in mecha mechanical engineering, right? Okay. Um, and. Uh, when you don't do engineering, you ski every month out of the year. That, that's right. Uh, this yeah. month will be my fourth year in a row of skiing every single month of the year. What got you on that? Um, it's just I love skiing. Um, I've always known it was possible. And so when I came out to Colorado, I just started doing it with some friends. And it is a great excuse to just make sure you're up in the mountains to some sort of rhythm. And so usually it's this one friend of mine and we just go out and chat and uh, every once in a while we get to ski a little bit, but it's a whole lot of hiking and a whole lot of work for a small amount of skiing in some of those summer months. Uh, you know, that's enviable. I love skiing. Right. I'm going to come up and ski with you uh, some month. So I would I, love I, that. Yeah, I would uh, suggest the winter months. They're usually a little more enjoyable. Right, right. Yeah, I might I might pick that just, uh, you know, for, for ease. Um, what got you to where you are, Tim? You're you're now uh, an entrepreneur. That's you right. You started out an, an engineer, and you do skiing. I don't yep. quite make it work. Um, so I got in like like most uh, young young males. Usually, I was pretty into the sciences at a young age, um, and then went off uh, to to study actually my undergrad degrees in a, a very specialized field called ceramic engineering. Uh, and I was a pretty hardcore scientist. I would say I very much liked being at the bench, liked doing experiments, building things, testing things, breaking things. Um, and actually, after after undergrad, that took me to a place called Oak Ridge National Labs, which is down in Tennessee. Uh, that's where a lot of like the Manhattan Project stuff happened a long time ago. It's a Department of Energy. Um, and I worked on a variety of things, but really did a lot of deep science and got to really hone my skills as an engineer and a scientist. And that kind of naturally led to a PhD program. I had a fantastic mentor down there in Tennessee, Andrew Wurzak, who's a fantastic scientist. Um, and he, he sat me down at a young age when I was 21, 22, and was just like, you know, you, you seem to have a desire to do this, a skill at this. You seem happy here. It's like, I would strongly encourage you to, to explore this academic kind of area, which is not something I'd really thought about before. Um, and so I looked into it. And actually, at that time, my wife and I, we, uh, we actually traveled the world actually, uh, in between. We, we lived in France and Thailand for a while for some skiing and some other things. Uh, but then after doing that for a little under a year, I did uh, find my way back into academia, did a PhD program at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, mechanical engineering is my, my title, uh, but really it was much more of a material science uh, area. Um, that's what I am at, at heart. I think that's I think uh, I think materials are an incredibly fascinating field of science. Uh, if you look at what defines history, it's often the material, the Bronze Age, the Stone Age, the Silicon Age that we're in now. Uh, these building blocks for us to to do things with are so important. That, that's how I got into material science, and that's where we are with Artemis now. Is we have this new kind of material science concepts to, to make things move, and we'll get into that moving forward. But at its at its core, we're much more of a of a technical materials uh, company than we are a traditional robotics company. All right. So before we get into the the depth of this, uh, w yep. what does your vintage truck camper have to do with all of these things? <laughs> uh, so I have a 1984 four wheel camper that lives on the back of my Toyota Tundra. Uh, I got that camper about five years ago. Uh, the reason you have it is because this is a little. Uh, fact that people don't realize Boulder is right against the mountains, but it's not in the mountains. What that means is we have traffic on the way up to go skiing on Saturday mornings, and I don't like that. 
And so I have a camper uh, that's very off-road capable. Uh, that has got a heater in it. And so I can go up there on a Friday night, camp out and be where I need to be to go skiing the next day. So as a, as a poor grad student, I bought that thing for just a few hundred bucks and spent a few years fixing it up. Um, and now my wife and my small child, we, we enjoy it quite often. So it's been fun. I like it. So listen, now that we're all soft enough, both you, uh, me, and, and hopefully the listeners, let's get to the real deal here because yeah, I have a very meaty question for you. Let's go. So you got this conceptual mess of actuators, motors, engines, machines, robots, automation, augmentation, all the way up to humans. Yep. What distinguishes all of these things? Because, you know, we will in a second talk about artificial muscles, which rely on some sort of actuators is your language. What's an actuator? Is it any different from any, from a motor? What are all these concepts? And is there a point in keeping them somewhat distinct or should I not worry too much? That's a fantastic question. And something I really value now as a, as a business leader in a technical field, what you're hitting on is the fact that different communities speak different languages. And sometimes they're saying the same things and people realize that and sometimes they're not. So you brought up a few different terms that we'll use kind of throughout this conversation. Um, motors, engines, actuators, automation, robotics. Let's talk about the first three first though, the engine, the motor, and the actuator. Usually, if you took a step back and just kind of talked about those three terms, you're, you're usually gonna imply making things move, right? A motor will almost always be rotational, right? So usually you'll make something move in a circle, which works really well when you wanna you know, power your Tesla or something like that. You gotta get wheels to rotate, that's really convenient. Engines also are usually quite similar where they're trying to make things spin. Uh, and then they're usually powered by, you know, heat. A heat engine is a typical term if you got into thermodynamics. But people, some people will absolutely use those term, terms interchangeably. I would say an auto mechanic and a traditional engineer might be saying an engine versus a motor and they might just be saying the same thing. And some might not. And it's going to depend on what are your inputs into that device and what are your outputs. Your outputs are probably rotational motion. Your inputs are probably electricity or some sort of heat. In the motor. Um, or for the motor, yeah. And then the actuator is just another set or another term there. Uh, actuator, again, is just something that takes some form of energy and turns it into another, usually mechanical motion. So an actuator would be a subset of something called a transducer, which just takes any form of energy, transduces it into any other form of energy. Form so that means energy. it could be hydraulic energy. It could be pneumatic. It, it could be... And you can get it. It could mean that it's taking electricity and turning it into motion. It could mean you're taking heat. You know, heat's another form of energy and turning it into electricity. A transducer could do all those things. Um, but then usually in, in most fields, robotics, I would say almost always, I would say most mechanical engineering fields, mo mo most technical fields, when they say an actuator, they almost always mean a linear actuator. And that means something that gives you linear motion, motion in one direction rather than spinning around. And you and I, we actually have a bunch of linear actuators on our body. Those are our muscles that contract in one plane. They pull or they push. So this is clarifying to me because then the distinction towards an engine is that the engine, at least in my very pedestrian language, is something that converts energy to a rotating motion so that Usually. you can actually, a mechanical type of thing, a device that actually, well, it doesn't have to move itself, but it moves something. Yeah, it's moving some part of it, which is probably going to be hooked up to a transmission that's going to use some that's going to move something else. But yeah, and then I mean, usually though, in 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 my field, in most fields, when people think of engines, they think of car engines where the inputs gasoline. But that mm -hmm. at its core is a heat engine. Mm -hmm. And ro robots in all of this, I mean, is it just the intelligence or the kind of uh, programmability of the machine that we are talking about, or is there something else? Yeah, let's get into the robot the terms robotics versus automation okay. because and i think a really good way to talk about that is to go into your home actually I, you, you're it looks like you're in your attic uh, apartment or something like that you probably have a kitchen downstairs your kitchen has some automation in it already but it doesn't have any robotics so to me automation is just you're automating you're causing some task to be done in an automatic manner and the example in the kitchen is your dishwasher Right. So automation is probably uh, defined as a as a as a device that has a set 
input and a set output and it and it does that task automatically so your dishwasher you put the dishes in you can't put your clothes in there you can't put your tools in there you, you can just you just put your dishes in the dishwasher you run a cycle for a set amount of time with some other parameters and get clean dishes out and so automation auto isn't necessarily that advanced in the sense that obviously if you're in an industry where there was no in automation, then automation could be a massive step forward. But but it's there's nothing autonomous, you know, another term. There's nothing kind of really creative or, or or really step change about it apart from the fact that I guess automation sort of was the industrial revolution. You boom. <laughs> automation <laughs> was the industrial revolution. So let's revolution. not forget. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you there's automated the, 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 the handwriting process with the printing press or whatever you want to do. Yeah. So, so I mean, at one point, it was output. a big step. But today, yep. if you're automating something today, you're not exactly using AI to do it. Necessarily. Not necessarily. because And you're hitting on one other part. A tr you And again, this is just my definition because you could find people that disagree with me in these different fields. But what I do believe, too, is when it comes to automation, one thing that's key in everything we've described is it's probably running off a set recipe, if you would. Do this thing for this amount of time, then do this thing, then do this thing. Mm -hmm. And if, as it's going through that process, if something goes off for some reason, there's no feedback, there's no monitors that are saying, oh, wait, make a different decision now because this didn't happen yet. Right, because humans would do that, right? If I'm washing a dish in my sink, I'm scrubbing it, I pull it up, I look, oh, it's still not clean, back down and scrub again. Well, yep. your dishwasher just, I just run hot heat for 10 minutes and that's all I do. Did it get clean or not? It has no way to determine. Yep. But then you're getting into the intelligence, which is when we get into robotics, where it's actively doing a task and maybe it can do a whole lot of tasks. And then the key is it's making decisions based around how that task is going. That's one of the key differentiators. Same with AI. That's what it's always doing is it's, is it's looking to learn about its environment and then there's a feedback so that it, the, the, the device, the robotic system starts to make different decisions based on what's actually happening there rather than just a set recipe of run for 10 minutes and see what happens. That is one of the most critical differentiators. Uh, between automation and robotics, in my opinion. And then when we get to the real interesting stuff, which is where we start approaching soft robotics, we get to this term augmentation, which I guess usually is reserved for augmenting a human worker. But of course, you could augment, I guess, any living thing sure. uh, in, in this kind of language. And whether the human, you know, and the human, I guess, is in the loop in this stage because you're augmenting a, you know, a living thing. Um, and, and robotics then, I guess, acts mostly on these, uh, you know, dangerous, dirty, uh, dull uh, jobs that nobody wants, that kind of thing. Yep. yep. But 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 now, as we're getting to to sort of robotics and soft robotics, what what is the point and why have you spent so much energy creating an actuator that is simulating a muscle, which so yeah. an artificial muscle? Because you know, I I guess this like sci-fi robots looked like robots, or or they. I guess looks like looked like machines. They they had two two form factors, but what is it that's the magical trick with with the way humans work that makes these uh, the idea of kind of approximating a human form factor like a muscle sounds to me like you're trying to approximate a human being. Why is that so important? And what are the challenges that have been stopping everyone from doing this up all the way until this point? Yeah. That's a, that's a big question. I'm going to unpack that in a few different steps. Uh, yep. The first one, why are we even doing this? And why are we, Artemis Robotics, approaching this kind of area of these artificial muscles and things like that? And I think what's really important, because you brought up the, the dull, the dirty, and the dangerous jobs, that's where robotics is going. There are individuals out there that are in these 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 low quality jobs that are either dangerous, they're repetitive and dull, or they're just dirty, they're unhealthy for them. Uh, and, and we need to use technology and use robotics to to help bring those people out of those situations and, and empower them into a better area. Uh, and a perfect example of that is fruit picking. People don't want to pick fruit. They just don't want to do it. Americans specifically have been declining in those positions for years and years and years. Interesting fact, this year in the middle of the citrus season down in Florida, when, when unemployment was through the roof because of COVID, still more Americans applied for that job than did the previous year, which is just, we just will not do it as a society 
because it's rough labor. I don't want to go do it. You don't. And most of our listeners don't either. It is hard labor. We can't blame anyone for doing that. You can't expect them to work that hard, that fast for that little of money. And so mm. we need technology to help augment those jobs. Mm. Um, so that's just like one example of where we really want to see robotics go. Now let's talk about where robotics is going. Um, how robotics has impacted society and, and you and I the most to date is over in what we talked about before, the artificial intelligence space. And so what I mean by that is our phones right, are really good at helping us kind of do things easier, faster, better, um, finding directions, scheduling appointments, making phone calls, sending text messages. Uh, all those, though, are intellectual jobs, right? And that's because they're all artificial intelligence powered, right? But you and I, we don't live purely in an intellectual space. We live in a physical space. I see you got a guitar behind you. You've got a beautiful office there. You know, we, humans are, we're designed to live in physical spaces. We're not designed to just live in intellectual thought spaces. But sure. yet robotics is only having an impact over there. The fruit pickers are still out there and, we, and Americans don't even want to do it. And it's because there's a physical task to be done. You can get AI to tell you when the fruits ripe a little bit more intelligently and things like that. But when the rubber meets the road, someone's got to go out there, use their physical abilities and pick that fruit. Now, why hasn't that happened yet? And it's because it's really hard to do that. It's hard to make things do a physical task similar to what humans are set up to do. And the reason for that is because humans are so dang good at doing what we do. We've evolved over millions of years into this form factor, which works pretty well for a lot of things. So let's yeah. talk, what is this form factor? Right. We are on a skeleton structure, right? We have rigid bones inside of here. And then we have these soft, compliant muscles on top of it. Your bicep can move in your hands. Your, your leg muscles all move. They're compliant. And so in the Keplinger Research Group at the University of Colorado Boulder, I was PhD student number one with Christoph. We're very good friends. He could come with this idea of like, we need new devices that can mimic what nature does. And we could start way over there with those servo motors and things like we talked about before and introduce crazy control algorithms and stuff and try to mimic the ability to move up and down and left and right. But maybe we're using the wrong ingredients. Remember that material science approach I talked about before. You've got to have the right building blocks if yeah. you want to at least attempt to build the right things. You need the right Lego pieces. And so that's where we started in academia is making the right Lego pieces. That's where that material science comes in. And we said, okay, what, sh what should that Lego piece look like? And that's humans, okay? Apparently, it should be compliant and stretchable and flexible and move in a linear direction and be controllable. And that's what the advent of our technology, which we call hazel artificial muscles, came from. So, so we really get into the actual muscle. Tell me a little bit about the entire field of soft robotics, because mm -hmm. for many who are not following this extremely closely, soft robotics is kind of just a term among other things. It obviously is somewhat new of a term, so people just don't quite understand. Soft in this case refers to what you just said, does it? it the, the fact that it's not metal pieces. I mean, although I'm sure you use metal as well, it's just that mm -hmm. the main material includes actual, what I would to touch call a softer material. Is that sure. is that exactly what I'm looking at? 100% about? correct, yes. We are talking about the actual physical state of the tools we're using. So the stretch, making using plastics and elastomers and rubbers to make devices that stretch rather than metal, rigid, precise things. We, we use a different approach to that. So that's exactly correct. And again, inspired by nature because you and I seem to be using those quite well. Right. So then, okay, but it's, isn't it also, when you start from scratch like that, it, doesn't it take a long time? Because you you had to say, well, you know, we're going to use a soft material. Well, that material had never been used, presumably, in that way. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of like, you're starting from first principles in a certain sense then. In some sense, yes. The interest in making compliant or soft actuators has been around for a while, like any good concept in academia. Uh, there's this old scientist, McKibbins, that had stuff, I think, back in the 50s, maybe even earlier. Don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, our, our, our forefathers in the scientific community have looked into these type of concepts for a while. 
more. So recent- it's not something that necessarily is extremely high tech to put together. Is it yeah. the concept that's high concept, or is it just it can be both? It can be both. It can be both, and that's one of the key benefits of what we have over at Artemis is that one one challenge that has been for soft robotics to break into mainstream has been some of the manufacturability and some of the um, just taking these you know kind of more complex materials and getting them mainstream. And so, actually, at our at our core, we try to use very simple, basic materials. So. Um, the principles and the materials we use are actually elegant and simplistic, and you know we, we're not we're not buying crazy elements that are only harvested under a full moon on Saturday afternoons or something like that. Um, we we just use basic things, but we put them together in a unique way. Um, and actually, what I'll say is there's a there's a company out in Boston called Soft Robotics Inc. that uses a very simple system that just uses air and rubbers, and they they're doing great, and they're bringing the, the field of soft robotics to the mainstream. Um, and so there, there are examples of, of, as people, I think, have worked in the field in academia for the past 20, 30 years, they've started to simplify it a little bit, too. And as they have done that, I feel like we're seeing better progress. Because when it is too complex, when it does have too rare of materials or, or something like that, uh, or too complex of processing, it just... Not enough people can can uh, use it or, or or work with it, so it can be a challenge. So, so then, uh, can you uh, go into a little bit of your product? Because an artificial muscle. Now, mm-hmm. first off, uh, you know whatever you can share. You know what is it that you're you're doing? Because some some uh, you know for the video part of this, I, I might be able to link to the actual video so they'll see it. Yep. But for the benefit of of our listeners, can you explain what the device does and and what the energy transfer you know is going to make us capable of doing that? that a hard robotic approach to this sort of same thing would just not be able to do. Yeah. So what our technology in at its core is it's a it's a thin plastic film. So so thin plastic film, think of a Ziploc bag, honestly. That's what most people are going to be familiar with when they think of thin plastic film. So it's essentially a, a bag that has some unique things in it. So we use some oils and then we also have some electrical conductors, so some screen printed electrodes. And we've designed that bag in such a way that when you apply an electric field onto it, so we use electricity. So when we impart electricity onto our device, which we call an artificial muscle, we can actually uh, cause it to contract. So linearly contract. That's that linear actuation we talked about earlier. So contracting means it started off as an inch and now it's only a half an inch. It pulled in a little bit. That's an, We can't do that quite that much stroke, but, but it's it's close. Um, and then also because of the way that we we make our devices, we can also make them so that they expand instead. Um, so if you think about it, often on the uh, human body again, we have these uh, antagonist pairs of muscles. So one will pull as one elongates. And so we can do a similar thing where we can design a system that's going to pull in when you turn it on, if you will. So send electricity to it, causes it to contract. Or we can design them so when you send electricity onto it, you can cause it to expand instead. So again, the example would be it, go, it would start off as just an inch, and now it's two inches long or something like that. Hmm. Um, and so that's what we make, uh, these yep. linear actuators, and, and ours are electrically controlled. Um, and that can be beneficial because then you can power it by a battery or something like that, with some other electronics, of course. Uh, but mm-hmm. compared to maybe being powered by air or you know a car is powered by gasoline or something like that, ours are just powered by electricity, and that can be beneficial. And so the advantages then uh, to... Other types of mechanical approaches is you, you is it speed is it the the density of the energy you know what, what, and what does this in the future because I'm assuming we're in the future here when you're actually trying to apply this to something what are you and others envisioning that these artificial muscles what are going to be the first use cases is it truly in humanoid robotics or is it in completely different types of use cases that that will be using these artificial muscles so you call them. Yeah. The dream is the humanoid robotic, for sure. Uh, Helping these robots walk around and interact with our everyday environment. Because we want robots, we don't want to change our environment so that the robot can work in it. We want the robot to change to work in our environment. I want to define it. I want to set up my house the way I want to set it up. And the robot just has to come in and deal with that, right? 
So it's robots and potentially this dream of the exosuit as well, because if I have, I've seen a bunch of exosuits and they're, you know, very heavy. So the problem is you may be able to lift a lot, but you need to attach yourself to some sort of electricity cable because you may, you know, you may, may have some gain, but batteries aren't at such a state, you know, that this, you actually have to generate the energy needed to lift the metal that you have now put on your own body or whatever other type of rigid, you know, material. Yeah. So is, is the use case here that, you know, your stuff could be an extremely soft material that doesn't weigh much. And, you know, you could create an exosuit that would be capable of generating some amount of lift. If I was trying to lift, you know, in the elderly, if I was working in a nursery home or something uh, and I had all these lifts every day, could an actuator be put upon uh, the task of sort of helping me make that lift, for instance? Absolutely, it could be. And I'd rather I'd, I'd take you a step further rather than helping you, the nursery home, <laughs> nursing home employee, lift the elderly. How about let's yeah. keep the elderly out of the nursing homes? So yes. one, one of the most exciting use cases of exosuits is not the exosuit for the car manufacturer, which is where most of the technology is. It's incredible technology. Don't get me wrong. But there are some other potentials where the exosuit just helps the person maintain their money. Uh, autonomy. It is the e-bike for everyday use. E-bikes are becoming very popular right now because I'm not trying to not use any energy on my commute to work. I'm just trying to get to work a little less sweaty and also it's just a little easier to do. It's gotten all these people into biking that it's just not hard anymore, but it's still good exercise. Like It's not like you're not exercising. It just makes it more approachable. The same concept is true. The elderly get get um, they have massive declines in health when they stop moving around, when they just sit in their chairs all day, then they're not engaging with the world as much. They're not just moving a little bit. And so if you could give them just some assistance, we're not talking about, I mean, the dream is to help maybe a, a, a paralyzed person walk again, but we don't need to replace everything. Again, that term augmentation. Can we just help them so that maybe as you're out, as you're aging in your fifties, in your sixties, it just keeps the ability to move around. Uh, more approachable. So you still go on your afternoon walk. When you still go on your afternoon walk, you just stay healthier long term in general. And so that's the real dream of not these incredible exosuit Iron Man things that can help our soldiers do crazy stuff. But what about just helping the general population maintain their autonomy longer in life, which has even better advantages to the rest of their life. They're just going to stay healthy in general. So Tim, wh absolutely wh assistive exosuits is somewhere where we're going in the future. Where, where, where is the startup and research field in soft robotics now when it comes to, uh, you know, actually, you know, acting on those use cases? Where are you in this journey with, yep. with your startup? Where, where are, you know, is any other soft robotics startup are we are we talking you know massive progress in the next three to five years are we talking end of this decade are we talking kind of quantum uh, you, you know are we talking sort of 10 15 year timelines to to develop something uh, not just marginally useful but uh, you know killer apps in this field yeah the exosuits and the humanoid robots uh, we have some partners actually for the one of those applications, the exosuit applications. We have some partners that are taking our actuators and applying them for that area, looking into it. Uh, you know, they believe that it's right around the corner and that's fantastic and we're excited to work with them. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to come together to make that happen. So will we have the e-pants of e uh, analogy to e-bikes in five years? I hope so. But that is um, that's a tall order. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and same the humanoid robot, that's a very tall order because it, it, while the mechanical motion, the physical tools, there's challenges to be met there and we can help solve those at Artemis. Um, there's a whole lot of other challenges there too. It's a very complex thing. Um, mm -hmm. Go watch if you want a good laugh or your listener or viewers do. Uh, go check out the DARPA Robotics Challenge where we have the best robotics folks out there coming together and trying to demonstrate um, how to use these robots to do these everyday tasks, like use a drill or open a door. And there's all these examples of them falling over and things like that. But on the complete, you know, right next to it, though, is the folks at Boston Dynamics. We see their YouTube videos, robots doing backflips and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a lot of really exciting things happening in the humanoid robotics field. Exosuit is similar. But what is true about what we're doing at Artemis and what other folks in the soft robotics space and for robotics as a whole are doing right now is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in our in our manufacturing and industrial settings. 
Um, there's a lot of demand for that. Labor costs are really up. A lot of these jobs are, like we said, dull, dangerous, dirty, and they're not healthy for people. And so there's a there's a pretty solid business case to, to take robotics into these industrial settings. Uh, but there's more than just a business case. Um, I'm very impressed with the field we work in. I, I think robotics is incredible, but the truth is it has a long way to go. And one of the reasons is when it enters into what's called an unstructured environment, like I said before, my office is an unstructured environment. A robot comes in, it's going to have to scan this entire thing, identify what's on the walls, identify everything, then figure out what to do with it. And that can be challenging. But in an industrial setting, you can tune back some of that variability. And that's going to help the field do some things sooner. And that's what's really going on. An industrial setting is more of a controlled environment than just the everyday world. And it's not perfectly you know, controlled, but it's Tim, I have different. I have a question in that regard. I find what you're saying fascinating. It's a little bit surprising, I guess, from one angle that we have invested as a society so much money and resources in white collar workers getting computers on their desks to presumably become, you know, X percent more efficient and arguably some succeed, some don't, right? You know, you clank a computer down on the desk doesn't mean that you become Thomas Edison. But <laughs> on the other hand, all these frontline workers are more or less working uh, like they did in the morning of time, you know, in Greece at the dawn of civilization, right? So why is this the case? Is it because, like you just pointed out, real life is so complicated and no one really thought that they could make a difference there? Or is it that the right minds just haven't applied themselves? And the moment they start to do so, which I guess COVID is one impetus to say, let's put the frontline worker a little ahead in terms of helping them out with technology, things will start to happen much more rapidly. Yeah. Great question. Don't have the answer. That's a big, big question. But let me kind of move through my thoughts with it. Timing in this ro robotics is an incredibly complex uh, field in terms of there's a lot of different pieces. Uh, there's hardware, there's software, there's firmware, there's everything in between. Um, and so with that, a lot of things come together to make a robotic system and hand it to you. Uh, and so where those different independent kind of components are at any point in time is very important, very much impactful. Is the vision up to wherever we need it? Is the motion, is the thought, the AI, uh, is the connectivity? There's so many things together. And while we've seen advances in all of those. Well, we're getting 4G on the moon right now. We're getting 4G <laughs> on the moon right now. I'm excited. We can, we can play some when, games, yeah. When you put all those together, people don't realize when you have a, a complex system, uh, any, uh, any inefficiencies, kind of, um, they accumulate on each other. So this one piece is, it works 90% of the time. And this one piece works 90% of the time. And so independently, just the vision, you got a vision company that can identify 90% of the things that get presented in front of it. Great, that's really impressive. And it sounds like it should be good enough, right? But then when a robotic solution is put together, there's five or 10 of those. And all of a sudden, they all compound and you have a different story. And so that's what's been really, I think, one of the, the main challenges that, that kind of resonates with me. But I'm not an expert in that, to be honest. But I can, you know, I'm definitely familiar with the field. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'll say that you brought up, and I, I think it's so important to highlight, is these white collar jobs getting a computer and everyone's better. And, and I think I just always talk about it because sometimes, especially when I'm talking to uh, certain individuals, they'll say, oh, you're a robot company, you're stealing jobs. And to be frank with you, that's just not true. It's just not true. Um, if you look at the modern workplace, and, and a gentleman from Google's X taught this to me, if you look at the modern workplace, the, the, the areas and the jobs that technology has the most impact on are kind of middle white collar jobs. Um, we're talking about the receptionist, the scheduler, uh, the switchboard operator, things like that. And those are the ones that are automated now. Your, your, your personal assistant on your phone can do all those things for you right now. Read your email, puts the calendar on, does all these things. But again, the, the actual physical tasks, that's not being automated right now. So what we're actually doing right now is distilling 
these kind of jobs that maybe people probably didn't want, we're distilling them down. And so we're only left with these laborist jobs and then the top, top jobs. And that's a big problem where I believe what robotics will do will actually, we're going to automate the laborist jobs, which are the, there's much more of those. That's the, the front line, like you said. And then we will need the, the folks above that. We will then elevate these people to running those systems instead. So presumably um, they would have more meaning and uh, better jobs and there would be, well, depending how you calculate, there would still be a lot of those jobs. They would demand some more skill, of course. Yep. But there wouldn't necessarily be zero of those jobs. Absolutely not. I mean, someone has to run. There's, there's almost always a human in the loop still, even at the most complex systems. Uh, a human made that at the first time. And I can, I can dive into it. Let me, just, let me just show you one more analogy to this, if you don't mind. Uh, if you go to a Walmart distribution center, I, I'm from upstate New York. It's a pretty, um, uh, you know, there's not a lot of jobs there. And a good job, though, that the, for the folks that don't go to college is the distribution center. It's a good job. And you're going to start off hucking boxes, right? You're throwing boxes. That's your that's your first job. That's your entry-level job. You're 18-year-old, low, low education. That's your first job. And they want to work their way up to a forklift driver. Forklift driving is a whole lot easier than hucking boxes every day, picking up 50-pound boxes. Um, and so that's where you're, you're going. That's the good job, right? But what's getting automated like right now? Forklift driving. All the all the Tesla AI self driving stuff it goes right to forklifts, man, and, and then that, that's a bit of a structured environment, so we can figure it out. Forklift automated forklift is around the corner, and that was the job that these people were trying to get to, and so now they've just been distilled down in love, another level, and it's and and the reason we keep distilling is because this AI is ready to go. Like I just said, the self driving, looking at the vision, making decisions, that's ready to go, but the physical task that's not. And that's why we do it at Artemis because we're trying to make tools so we can we can do these physical tasks it's so important to do um so tim here's here's a big question for you please if you are one of those people in upstate new york who yep. were peers of you in your fifth grade class but they're they're for various reasons decided not to go to college um many of them very clever others you know clever but you know realize they're not interested you know in the phd track that you went on for lots of reasons i wasn't either man. i wasn't too right far and off. and you know believe me we've done phds that it's not all the glory that it all sounds like it's actually you know also uh, you know there's a lot of pain in, in there but anyway look, what is the advice to someone who is either young today or or not young anymore but realizes that you know this wave is coming they're going to be around when this starts to happen how do you prepare for that? And how hard is it? Because yes, it's not going to be zero jobs, but the jobs will morph in character. And if we're lucky enough that there still are those jobs around us, we will, all of us, have to adapt. What, what is the way to train for this augmentation phase of human labor? Um, and are, what are the training tools to I do that? I think the number one thing to do is to become flexible with what you're comfortable with. And you need to be comfortable with not being comfortable, quite frankly, because technology changes so fast. Like it, it'd be easy to tell someone, go get trained up in PLC controllers, right? Cause that's what everyone's gonna use when we're automating a factory. But the truth is, especially if you're going with a younger generation, by the time they're in the workforce in 10, 15 years, whatever they got trained up on, it's going to be pretty radically different and maybe not even be there because technology moves so fast. And so it's so much more important to be willing to learn, to know how to look at these problems and, 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 and just, just come to them with beginner's mindset, no matter what your education level is and know how to unpack them and figure your way through them. That's what I would say. But, and that's the hardest thing to do. Um, it's, it's very difficult to do because everyone wants to just get trained up on how to do a certain task and then I can just go do it. And, and that, that's great. But the truth is, in my opinion, that's not what the modern workforce looks like. Um, and so how you get, how you become more comfortable with entering these unknown areas, uh, in my opinion, is good mentors. Uh, that, I think that's what separates me from other folks around me, why I've been able to be moderately successful. It's too early to say that I'm absolutely successful. But having people around you that, that can show you that, hey, maybe I didn't know what I was doing then either, and it worked out, and this and this yeah. happened, 
right? It's good. I, I can't under stress the value of good mentors around you, which are essentially role models, right? Yeah. Um, and so that, that's what I would suggest. That's a big question, though. Technical Tim over here is probably not the, the perfect person to respond to that. Uh, but those are some of my thoughts on it. All right. So so then just uh, fi finalizing that question in terms of let's say you are more on the manager side or you run a company and th this company has a, a bunch of frontline workers, maybe hundreds and or, or, or thousands and in, in various sort of uh, kind of factory configurations. How do you track the field? For instance, your field, soft robotics, how do you stay up to date on that field? Where do you go? maybe more on the strategic side, you're, you're trying to figure out when's this going to apply to me? How can I get plugged in with uh, an exciting startup that does work in this field? What are the use cases that might apply to my company? Uh, where do those folks go? There's a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, trade organizations that are doing things like this now that try really hard to partner with small startups like me and bring the right people to the table to say, here's a big corp that has these problems. Here's a small corp that might have technology that can help. How do we get these two people interacting? One that we're a part of, uh, just participated in their program last month, or last week, excuse me, is ARM, uh, Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing, based out of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's plenty of them. AIA is another example of those type of trade shows that we're a part of. Uh, AIA is... is uh, Advanced Institute of Automation, I believe. Uh, but so th there's trade organizations that are doing it. Um, and then it's just though, it's going to be, it, it, it's going to be on the responsibility of like the startup like me to, to really market and broadcast some of our capabilities. That's something that I balance as a CEO of a young company is balance is what can we do today? Because for some people that use case is perfect, but what can we do tomorrow for you as well? Because for these big corps, let's say, uh, yeah, today's important, but tomorrow with the timing and everything, that's just as important too, assuming I can deliver on that. So how confident am I in on it? What's realistic there? You're not trying to just sell the moon to them, but you're also trying to say, here's where we're going and here's how we could interact. Uh, so trade organizations is one example of those. There's a lot of great ones. Um, and then also just the, the startup should be directly kind of educating as much as possible because that's, let me, let me comment on that. That's one thing that we've dealt with. We're asking traditional roboticists, in, machine integrators, folks like that, instead of using a traditional metal rigid motor to use this soft compliant structure that looks like a Ziploc bag, you're saying, and, and moves when you apply electricity, I promise you it can be really beneficial for some of your applications, but I got to help educate you up on that. And that's my responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, that person was trained in a certain manner with certain tool sets, and now I'm throwing something new in there. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so education and communication is really important there. Last question. This is going to be a challenging one. Put me in your lab 10 years from now. What are you doing? What are we doing in 10 years? We are taking our actuators and making them stronger than human muscle so that we can get into applications that are currently not applicable to us. Uh, we're not just in a lab anymore. We have a big production facility. We manufacture here in Colorado. Uh, and we have applications everywhere. So a company that I look up to is actually a small little company, jokingly say, like Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi started off as a motor company making this goofy motor for mining. Now we know Mitsubishi is massive, massive global company that makes uh, these components, these, these tools for all these industries. And that's where Artemis is going. So our hazel actuation technology, hazel artificial muscles, that's just the first step. We're going to continue to refine those. We're going to continue to, to produce those. But then we're going to get them into a lot of interesting applications that are going to help people really, really kind of change the way they do things. Tim, I love talking to innovators. This is so such a fascinating field. You are a fascinating guy. And I believe, you know, some combo of skiing uh, and robotics, you know, either of those or in combination will give you uh, a bunch of success. Uh, thank hey, you for coming I, on the show. I very much appreciate it. This was a very fun conversation. Thanks for having me. Are you excited or curious about the future? Does your job depend on it? Futurized goes beneath the trend. If you like the topic of robotics, you may enjoy episode eight on deep learning, episode nine on edge computing, episode 16 on perception AI, episode 30 on artificial general intelligence, episode 31 on the future of commoditized robotics, or episode 54 on the future of AR.